welcome to another episode of the Centaurs or Cyborgs podcast, where we cover AI and machine learning. I'm your host, Nicholas DeVoe, a machine learning researcher and occasional entrepreneur. Today, we're doing a journal club. I'm being joined by two of the authors of a paper at the intersection of machine learning and biology. Today's topic is proteins the ubiquitous, diverse, molecular machines that run our cells. We'll be discussing a method to encode these proteins into a neural network's representation of the world, aka its latent space, so that we can look for similar proteins in that encoding. This is essentially RAG for proteins. That's retrieval augmented generation. Lately, the world has become acquainted with this concept due to the rise of large language models. The idea behind RAG is to train an encoder neural network, then taking a query encoded into that network's latent space and doing a search for nearby documents in that encoding. Three or four, maybe five nearest neighbors, and then using that as input to a large language model. This paper presciently describes how to make a vector database for proteins using information from both their amino acids, AKA their sequence, and also their 3D structure. So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's guests. I'm being joined by both Timur Hamamsi, who completed his PhD at NYU Center for Data Science in 2023, and is the co-founder of Fair Health, and Dan Berenberg, a current PhD student at NYU's Courant. We all overlapped, at least at some point, at the Flatiron Institute, where we were part of the Bonneau Lab. Timor, how did you find your way uh, into computational biology um, and machine learning? Yeah, so I guess before, uh, thank you for, for having me on, on, on the podcast, uh, and, and Dan as well. Uh, uh, before uh, knowing about machine learning or, or you know, all opportunities in comp bio, um, I started working in um, data science, and or I, I wanted to work in data science, um, and I, I somehow landed uh, in a bioinformatics role at Mount Sinai, where we were doing um, genetics, genetics research, um, specifically around psychiatric diseases, and that got me really excited about um, this weird bioinformatics space where you know, people were um, writing command line tools and using Perl and you know, very old school approaches to, to analyzing you know, massive um, reams of DNA data. And then from there, I, I, I met you at, at the Flatiron Institute um, where we, we worked in the Center for Computational Biology and um, after doing research, decided that I wanted to get a PhD and, and dove in to the ML bio space with um, uh, one, one advisor who's more focused um, in computational biology, um, Rich Bono, who we all worked with, um, and another advisor who's more focused in machine learning, uh, Dan Young Cho, who Dan and I also worked with um, as an advisor. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's my you know, story, how I got into it. Yeah. Um, sort of similar. I um, I did my undergrad at University of Vermont in math and sort of stayed along for an accelerated. During that time, I did an internship at the Flatiron Institute with Rich Bonneau, um, where it was sort of a, a you know a systems biology lab. And so they're applying, you know, taking putting on my complex systems hat, but sort of thinking about these biological problems, learned about a, a lot about biology there and, and proteins, which I was totally unfamiliar with coming from sort of strictly math. Um, and then afterwards, after my master's, I joined the Flatiron Institute and, um, you know, was working there sort of on some AI related projects uh, with uh, in particular f protein function prediction. Um, and then later on, uh, I also decided to start my PhD at NYU. Um, since then, I, I, also, I joined a startup, 
did some protein design there, and now I'm sort of back at NYU. And um, that's sort of my story. Great, thanks. All right, so to start out, um, you worked on language model representation for proteins. So what is first the underlying reason why we want to model proteins in such a model? What's the benefit of a learning representation? Yeah, so you know, there's obviously been an explosion of language models uh, like ChatGPT and um, countless others. And, and um, what you know, the research found is that you know, an objective function to just predict the next word is actually a pretty good objective function. Um, and um, the same architecture is the same kind of objectives that have been so useful in language apply equally well or even better to proteins. Because um, proteins are just sequences of tokens. Um, language is just sequences of tokens as well. Um, the vocabulary of proteins is highly restrictive. There are you know, fewer than, than what, 26 if you count. With the you know, ambiguous amino acid identities, yeah. It's mostly 20. 20. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and you know, there's so much evolution um, that has basically guided and um, selected patterns and, and, and added statistics to sequences of proteins that are a lot more predictable than perhaps, you know, language syntax that is just made up because, you know, yeah. evolution is guided. Yeah, I'd also add that one, one reason why we want to, we would, we're interested in building a representation using a language model is that is because, um, you know, natural language, protein sequences, um, molecular, uh, sequences like smile strings, they all live inside of this extremely high dimensional space where you choose a token. You can, you know, if you have a sequence of some length L then there, and a vocabulary of some size like V, then there's L to the V, um, uh, or V to the L possible sequences that you could really generate, um, mm -hmm. with, with that vocabulary. And so when we learn a sort of model of this, of this data, we're actually learning a low, very a much more low dimensional representation, much smaller than that, uh, than that number that allows us to sort of smooth way. Yes. Know? So if you think about the fact, this might seem overwhelming that there are billions of known proteins out there, but at the same time, the search space, the space of all possible proteins is so much larger than that, that the billions of possible proteins is actually a pretty narrow manifold in that really high dimensional space. Yeah. And essentially, how do you approximate that, that space? How do you get into this really like Goldilocks zone of where evolution has already allowed us to find proteins? Um, you get into that zone by um, trying to build the best possible representation. Is, is that, that would be the motivation, right? And once you do that, you can then build any other kind of AI tool potentially on top of it, like you example, had examples of classifiers in, in your work, but the, what I'm sort of seeing across many industries, right, is that there's a motivation to create a representation so that then you can have downstream effects. You can say, oh, I'm, I'm gonna now try to think about this protein um, and its effect on certain diseases based on where it lands in the representation space. Um, so were you already doing work on language to, to get into this? So the approach is much more, okay, well, we're seeing all the exciting things happening in language models. Let's see, let's figure out how to apply it. So, I mean, in our case, it was, uh, we were both, you know, getting our PhDs in AI, more or less, and um, have an advisor who uh, discovered attention and is a language modeling mm -hmm. um, expert. Uh, so it was natural for us to start language modeling proteins and to take that approach. And I think biology always trails behind machine learning by a couple years. And you know, by the time we started working on this, you know, there was a quorum of, of researchers starting to you know, 
point point their their you know fingers towards towards language modeling for representation learning and um, for a lot of these downstream problems like protein function prediction and for um, mm -hmm. sequence alignment and for um, the classic computational biology problems. Obviously, AlphaFold to an AlphaFold made a huge splash in the structure prediction space as well. So yeah. I think there were these you know, major milestone moments where um, everyone realized, like, yeah, you need you know very uh, very good language models to to represent proteins to compete. Yeah, um, can you describe? Just shortly, what is TMFEC and sort of what the high level problem was and then what the approach was? Yeah. So, at a, at a very high level, um, you know, as you mentioned, there are billions of proteins that we know about. Um, and, you know, we infer a lot of those proteins just from DNA sequencing because we know start, start codons, stop codons. Um, and even though we you know, have the sequences for billions of proteins, we don't really have annotations for most of them. Um, so the way we organize biological information is, is with annotations. By annotations, you know, we mean uh, protein function, protein structure, protein family, other information like that. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it's just too experimentally expensive to do all the experiments necessary to elucidate all the structures and functions for the billions of proteins. Mm -hmm. So, as a result, computational tools have, have become necessary and, and um, widely applied to annotate the protein universe. Um, and, and historically, like the last 30 years, the main tool for doing that annotation has been BLAST, uh, or the basic local alignment search tool. Um, and that's a sequence search tool where basically you find a new protein sequence um, or DNA sequence and you have your database of known sequences that have been annotated, mm -hmm. and you do some sequence alignment, and if there's enough of a sequence overlap, you say, ping, you know, let's transfer that annotation over to the to the new protein. Gotcha, um, so there's like a big dark matter, big amount of dark matter in this protein universe of most proteins, we don't know what they're doing, and then we do at least have for all these billions of proteins we found, we have a sequence. The only thing we have is a yeah. sequence for, for for a lot of the unknown proteins. We just have a sequence, but we can at least do sequence similarity, see how yeah. there's find the most similar ones, and then based on the nearest similar ones based on sequence, we then assume it has function and structure that's like the most similar one. And the, the problem with just looking at sequence without structure information, without mm -hmm. other other sources of information, is that their you know, sequence homologies might only cover 50% of proteins. Mm -hmm. um, structure homologies that are captured over longer evolutionary time scales, um, because structure structure is, is preserved over longer evolutionary time scales, would, would be more informative for for a search case. Um, so that mm -hmm. the main motivation, I think, for TMBEC was can we do structure aware sequence search at tree of life scales? So Got can it. we do what BLAST has done, but do it in a structure aware way? Got it. And you know, deep learning and language models and kind of learning representations of manifolds where you know distance can be structure aware rather than just kind of sequence aware mm -hmm. is was the, the main, I guess tool to, to get there. So naively, um, you already mentioned AlphaFold as a computational tool to get a structure. Um, would there be a way to plug in AlphaFold to get a structure and then do search there? Or was this being ideated before AlphaFold? So uh, AlphaFold 2 uh, definitely came out before we started working on this, um, but not all of their computational structure groups. So not all of their predictions came out. So I think there was uh, it first came out and they they released they they kind of jerked Swiss prod out in terms of their predictions yeah. and then um, towards the end of the project, or maybe after we had submitted, uh, they they had partnered with um, with with who? 
they partnered with uh, well, they partnered with the EBI to, yeah, exactly. to you know generate uh, protein structures for everything that's in Unipro, this huge database of most proteins that we know of. Mm-hmm. Um, one one issue with this with using AlphaFold could be well, AlphaFold is actually surprisingly slow. You need a multiple sequence alignment in order to run AlphaFold. Uh, so chicken and egg problem, right? So what's nice about TMVEC is that uh, we have we have a language model you can think of it as a boiled down like Redux that represents a, a multiple sequence alignment. You know, you've seen billions or millions of um, protein sequences, and now the, rep- the underlying representation itself rep- lives on the underlying multiple sequence alignment sort of manifold. And so now, the, I mean, the idea here is that you're sort of, sh- you know, now short circuiting the the necessity for, uh, or short, you know, shortcutting the necessity for um, an actual multiple sequence alignment, and mm-hmm. the. One of the major benefits of TM, TMVEC is that you can predict a structural signal from sequence alone. If you try this with language models pre, pre TMVEC, they they, um, they don't perform as well. You know, so you have this you you injected a structural structural information into the model's representation through this sort of elegant like loss function mm-hmm. um, that allows you to do this search. But you don't you don't need a structure, and you perform better than sequence alone. So it's um, kind of a there's all several benefits there. Okay, wait. So let's so yeah. So let's maybe go into uh, maybe a higher level of detail there, since um, you started describing a little bit of the mechanism. Um, so you already use as input a protein language embedding. Is, is that correct? To, as input to it, and then you are learning something that is not needing the structure, but is structure aware. So, right. so how is that, is, is that awareness pulled in? Okay, so, I mean, do you wanna? Oh, okay, so the, the idea is there's a well-known score um, from the bioinformatics world, you know, lots of deep learning methods borrow, borrow from, you know, we, we stand on the shoulders of our, you know, bioinformatics forefathers <laughs> and we, um, where you, the TM score represents a, a similarity score between two structural domains. And so it tell, it's a number between zero and one, where if it's generally, if it's greater than 0.4, we consider the protein structure to be, uh, the, the two protein structures to be sort of the same fold. They, they, exi- they would exhibit similar structural topological elements. Mm-hmm. Whereas less than that, you're likely different, a different fold. Um, and so the idea here is you take, uh, you, you run the TM score, which is actually, it's not super fast, but it's tractable enough to generate a whole lot of pairs of triads that are protein one, protein two, their TM score. So you, t- you, t- you, you train on a bunch of like, of, of these, uh, triads mm-hmm. by, um, you taking as input a representation that comes from a language model and then emitting a score um, that by comparing the, the two representations and performing a mathematical operation that allows you to like, you know, the, the dot product that allows you to, you know, basically compute the similarity of these two protein representations. And so if you are trying, what this model is, is it then is just something that takes us input to proteins, uh, gets their um, sort of language model representations does some downstream processing and finally computes this dot product, which eventually returns to you a single number. And you just want to make sure that that number it, um, is as close to the real TM score uh, that you're that you're training on as possible. And so, in this process, mm-hmm. since you since you that signal is structurally informed, you've you've now biased the um, upstream uh, embeddings to be structurally informed. So your, your neural network, the neural network is this idea of a universal function approximator. You, you know, neural networks getting information about structure coming from this TM score? Yeah. That right? And the TM score, still trying to understand, its information about structure comes from whatever bioinformatics it's, it's lit- score, isn't it? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's, some, it's a score that actually takes as input to protein structures. Uh, so this would be, this. The requirement here for this training is already having two known structures. 
Right. But because we, you know, all, even though the dark matter of this universe is like 80, 90 percent or more of it, there's still the 10 percent is enough data that we can right. train it using the known protein structures and their scores. So that's where the structure awareness leaks into the model. The neural right. network starts approximating it due to being a universal function approximator. So we, we had to, like every, every protein in our data set had a, a structure. Mm -hmm. alongside it. So um, in order to cover, I guess, all possible domain comparisons and structure comparisons that we have to experimentally verify fun uh, structures for, we had to create a really big data set of pairs um, and run TM Align, which is you know, generating that TM score mm -hmm. um, for you know, billions of, of protein pairs. Um, and was there any kind of elimination or filtering if a protein happened to have multiple confirmations or any, any issues around, around that? So, well, TM, TM Align is a global, um, it's a global structural comparison. Um, so, so there weren't any problems there. One of the um, feedback that we have done is, um, you know, you should do the same thing for you know, local comparison using another you know, local alignment local structural alignment algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, because you can imagine training the, you know, with the exact same architecture doing, doing that for a local comparison rather than a global comparison. Sure, so your architecture seems generalizable. You essentially yeah. were able to say protein one, protein two, some yeah. scoring function. We can now have that scoring function feed in, maybe it could be a local scoring function or other, fu other scoring functions of interest. Yeah. Um, but as it was, it was a single, um, loss function coming from the TM score was the... Yeah, so, the so we would um, essentially, like, the output layer of our pipeline was just learning a vector representation for protein 1 and for protein 2. And then the loss function mm -hmm. involves taking the cosine similarity of those two vector representations and making sure that that cosine similarity is as close to the TM score as possible. So in other words, we're right. making sure that our vector space, which is high dimensional, but represents the protein, um, is as close to a structure space as possible. And this vector space uh, was around what size? All known proteins, <laughs> all known proteins get, go into some 500-ish size dimensional space. It doesn't matter how big or small a protein yeah. is, it'll get mapped into that space. Exactly. That way you can do comparisons across any protein. Um, could you generalize it to other things that have structure like RNA um, and, and compare it to proteins? If it's the case that the TM score works on RNA, then mm -hmm. sure. I mean, or if you had, I mean, like you said, if you have any structural or any sort of metric that you really care about, yeah. then now we can learn, we can force the embeddings that come from this model to um, their distance now uh, is like proportional or very like similar to that distance metric that you were interested in. So it's mm -hmm. like, so, I mean, just the full pipeline is really nice because now you have this huge combinatorial space of proteins, you're embedding it into only 512 numbers and you, and you know for sure that any, any two pairs of those uh, 512 you know, dimensional vectors, their dot product, uh, meaning their distance is essentially proportional to the TM score. Or yeah, you could apply it to RNA, you could apply it to, um, uh, you know, whatever, uh, mm -hmm. GC content in a, in a genome, you could, you could probably like, if you like compress two genomes, you could probably, yeah. Computer, you can make you can make these vectors close mm -hmm. in GC content space, you know, based yeah. on that metric. Yeah. Got it. So we have so now this model is able to give you an embedding of a vector in a structure space, and you can do similarity searches for ones that are nearby. Um, did you explore um, other aspects of the of spaces? Were there other spaces that um, do also of interest for for doing? Similarity searches? Yeah, so we did extend the work uh, in another paper called Protein Vet, where we looked into several different aspects of proteins. Um, so, you know, 
protein function as an example. Mm -hmm. um, there are many ways that we categorize function with the gene ontology, um, with enzyme commission number, so what enzymes um, are catalyzed by, um, by, by the uh, protein. And, and so, so we did kind of train you know, many contrastive learning models, those different aspects, and we actually combined them all together into one kind of protein deck model where you could turn on and off certain aspects depending on the type of search that you wanted to do. Mm, so, um, so to turn on or off those aspects was that the protein was going into like five different embeddings, and then you, or was it different than that? Uh, so when I yeah when I say turn on and off, I mean you know at search time. So yeah. Once the model's been trained and you have your database, um, you can embed your query protein not just with the amino acid sequence, but also with whatever aspects you want to search over. So if you want to search over just protein function or structure and function or sequence structure and function, mm -hmm. then you could could do that. And when you when you do and when you do that search and you say I want a keyword for co combinations of things, it would return nearest neighbors. Exactly. So that was like the thing that vectors unlocked for us because then we could embed an um, entire database of protein sequences, mm -hmm. no matter how big, and then just have you know, one vector for every protein sequence, and then search scales. You know, There's so much infrastructure that's being built for vector search. You see all these you know, language modeling companies that are popping up. Yeah, That's yeah. Right. I mean, which I know, like in the tech world, no one knew what a vector database and retrieval on a vector database was like two years ago. And of course, now mm -hmm. it's become like, you know, you need it in order to raise money, basically, to have some kind of retrieval augmented generation. Exactly. So if we were just um, relying on, on some infrastructure that Facebook had built called uh, FAISS, uh, F A I S S. I don't know how to, how to pronounce it. And um, they basically scaled vector search to internet scale databases, you know, billions of vectors. Mm. Um, and conveniently for us, you know, you can, uh, as a distance metric, use cosine similarity. So uh, we pretty much get out of the box um, our TM score prediction when we do yeah. search, because all we need is the two vectors. And if we get cosine similarity, we get TM score. And so you mentioned contrastive learning. Yeah. Um, so what component in this is uh, contrastive learning? Yeah, so TMBEC, um, we are comparing two protein, uh, or two vectors, and mm -hmm. um, we're, we're applying a, a twin neural network, which is in the family of contrastive learning. Um, with So in, in other words, we're applying the same network to two different protein sequences. And then... Both, both of those networks are outputting um, vectors, mm -hmm. and then the loss function is applied over um, you know, the comparison of those two vectors. With um, protein vec, we instead kind of took a more classic approach to interest learning, mm -hmm. where we leveraged triplets, where you basically have um, three proteins in every sample, training sample. So you have an anchor protein, positive protein, which has the same labels as the anchor protein, and a negative um, protein, which has different labels from, mm -hmm. the positive, from the anchor protein. And then there, your objective function is to minimize the distance between your anchor and positive and maximize the distance between your anchor and negative. So that's more classic contrastive learning in a sense where you'll have two inputs that are similar, one that's dissimilar, yeah. and then you try to change your network in order to make the two similar ones more similar in its space. So I want to ask uh, about during the process of working on this project, um, what were the blockers, things that were, were surprised that you were, were stuck on, but became stuck on, um, and vice versa, things that started going very fast? So I think everyone here can speak <laughs> from personal experience that the yeah. two most, uh, time-consuming and uh, frustrating parts of comp computational biology research are the data and kind of all the mess of 
cleaning, making the data set, scaling the data set, because now like you know, the scale is just you know, billions of pairs, so it's, you know, that's a lot of data to create. And then benchmarking. Benchmarking ends up taking all of your time as a PhD student. Um, and we're not as lucky as you know, the MNIST uh, AI researchers that have benchmarks <laughs> that you can just you know, submit to and everything is, is populated. We have to create our own benchmarks. We have to Run dig, in, yeah. dig into the archives of biology methods, become bio methods that don't work and only work if you're on a mountaintop or underwater. And yeah, you need to, you need, yeah. The, yeah, the, there are major blockers in terms of data preparedness. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you always need to, you know, first part of every computational AI biology project is get it, pulling down the data from some standard database that's been up since the 90s and then actually getting it into a format that works for you. You know, the, the computational complexity of computing like billions of, billions of pair similarities, you know, obviously it's like quadratic. So you have a million pairs, now you need a million times a million uh, similarities. And so that's a, that can be definitely frustrating. Um, and then, yes, I mean, broadly, you know, all, all, our entire field, um, it's not like computer vision or even NLP at this point where you can kind of import a library in Python that's like, you know, it has a, has a single function called benchmark and takes us into yeah, a hug yeah, and face yeah. model. Yeah. And it's just, yeah. So, um, so that was definitely difficult. Uh, yeah. Which, which is demoralizing because you would think that uh, getting to a breakthrough or trying out new methods would be where the majority of brain power can be spent. But like if time is spent on benchmarking, um, then that would be something you'd hope would be repeatable or easily repeatable for new for new innovations. Um, definitely um, one of the reasons why um, the seeing tools like Copilot, any kind of like code generation tool that allows code to be um, more easily generated, um, seem really useful. And also seeing things like collabs going into the cloud, finding ways for people to reuse like infrastructure um, is, is useful. Um, but also just generally, there's a sometimes lack of uh, motivation to do, to have code be published, the, soft, the software engineering to keep your code base up to date, which was actually um, one of the things that drew me um, to the Center for Computational Biology and actually sort of allowed this podcast right now to be happening for me to have met you guys was that the group you're a part of was part of an institution that's who's motivated to produce an open source code. So. To that, um, to that effect, the code for this, it's up on uh, GitHub. I, I'll just add one more thing. It's just that, I mean, of course there are benchmarks mm -hmm. in CompBio, you know, like there's the tape data set and you, you know, almost weekly you see new benchmarks, but you know, the other, the, the other issue with our field is that there are so many sort of contrived tasks that have to do with, you know, very, you know, calculating various biomolecular properties or, uh, you know, structural, you know, it, you know it, it's very much problem specific. And so it's, it's hard to develop a benchmark like that. that. That makes sense. Yeah, exactly. When you're in the space of computer vision, humans will know, okay, I can label this as a tree or a cat or something. Yeah. But in the space of computational biology, um, it's more fragmented and human intuition is not as useful and finding the right benchmark can be difficult. In fact, you may, there was one very clear benchmark, the benchmark of um, structure prediction that AlphaFold um, had this big success against. But even there, if someone was outside the field and is looking and waiting to see, oh, in what ways have, has machine learning and you know, finally being the holy grail of biology, figuring out structure prediction, well, actually, have there even been any downstream effects benchmarks that a, a person outside the field would have noticed. And even even there, it's like, well, limited effects um, outside. So I think that, yeah, to start figure out which benchmark um, to go against and essentially like measurements of quality is difficult in fields where you're not simply trying to replicate human vision or language, which, which there's already a gold standard of human capability. 
Um, were there any surprising things um, along the way? I think we were surprised at the, I, I, I think the first time Dan and I were surprised was when we compared the embeddings that we're just looking at sequences to structure embeddings because there, there's this whole field of kind of using graph neural networks for embedding um, protein structures and using kind of different um, kind of graphlets and wavelets to embed them. And we kind of compared how well the, um, the different embedding approaches um, clustered um, the calf hierarchy. So mm -hmm. calf is the, this famous um, uh, protein data set um, that goes, uh, basically has um, annotated proteins uh, or protein domains. Um, the C standing for class, so that's like uh, alpha, beta, uh, A for architecture, which is you know, not quite um, homology, but you know, it could be homology, right? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, like class is like, there's only three yeah. three groups. You know, you're either an alpha, beta, or second, like low amount of secondary structural elements, protein, or maybe there's a fourth one. Architecture is like, uh, okay, so these secondary structural elements, you know, um, they're organized in a vaguely in the you know in some kind of format. So there's more architecture classes, but it still doesn't totally tell you about sort of like the the fold, uh, what, is the, what is the actual fold identity of this uh, protein? T, uh, sorry, oh, okay. topology. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it's, that's your fold family. Um, so, you know, Tim barrels, Im, I, immunoglobulin folds, they all fall into the topology class. And then there's a, the, the last tier. You know, what we're doing is we're like spanning down an ontology of different structural classes. The last tier is called uh, is H homologous superfamily? So there, you kind of do use some some sequence similarity in order to really split split topological classes. So that now it's sort of like they're, they're sequence similar now. Um, so so in general, when you are doing this type of benchmarking, you're interested in the T tier because that's that tells you about the the most specific um, sort of shape of uh, of the protein and. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was awesome when when uh, it, it was, you know, TM Beck was blowing these other uh, these other things we were benchmarking it against uh, out of the water. And I think that was super surprising, super nice. Kind of as a, almost a side effect, right? Because it was kind of simply from the structure, sort of the same way that people were surprised that how did an autoaggressive large language model able to, is it able to come up with um, and to be good at math or medicine or things like that, so almost as a side effect of replicating. Yeah, like like this, just the simple t task mm -hmm. actually has you know profound implications in terms of the the capabilities of the representation because the, the way these benchmarks were constructed is it's sort of a function of the representation alone, um, and so yeah, so definitely that was really cool. So taking a step back to compare with large language models, um, part of the excitement that people have with large foundational models is that if you're able to come up with some good embedding space, you can then put a pretty small classifier on top of it to yeah. then accomplish very specialized things. Maybe people know the term fine tuning as like a, an idea with large language models to give it just hundreds or so examples and then is able to be a specialist in a certain domain. Um, were there any classifier heads that you put on top of this embedding space or could imagine being useful to put on top of it? Yeah, I mean, if you have a, a solid um, representation, I mean, here we're not, um, we're learning a flat vector for proteins, so mm -hmm. probably would recommend uh, a, um, a classification head on top of the residue embeddings. But still, you'll, you'll learn, I mean, if it's, if it's you know, separating all of the different structural classes, it's gonna be good at never um, search it was able to yeah you, you could have met if you i mean it's still tm vec it's just that if you had sort of access to the residue level representations pre uh you know compressing it down to this flat vector you can imagine like predicting like secondary structural class of a protein which which could be really applicable to you know for example metagenomics 
mm-hmm. where you know you have this bio sample, you're not really sure kind of what's inside of it, what type of protein, what has even was living in there, what organisms, and so now you just want to know what is this, what is this, you know, things, what are these things even folding up into, you know, so. Um, you know, like you might find you know, alpha helices or whatever, and, and you know that that's just you know added information that allows you to kind of like make assessments about this biosample. So, mm. so if we're look, if you're looking at the residue model, that would be the underlying model that you took as input. Is that is that correct? Meaning like that's the sequence only um, embedding? Because um, you're saying if you wanted to, to look at the the residue of that, and that would be, instead of being a flat vector, that one is as long, that one's proportionally long to um, the length of the protein. Exactly, yeah. Right? Um, how did you solve the issue of the inputs to your model being different lengths, in that, in that, if that was the input? Yeah, so we, um, you know, to get into maybe too much detail, we took the residue embeddings from large protein model mm-hmm. for trans. Um, then we had um, you know a few transformer encoder layers that were applied to that. Mm-hmm. And then we um, you know, eventually you have to average pool. So so we <laughs> we average pooled uh, and then uh, that led us to, you know after applying you know linear layers to the average pool and uh, pool uh, vector we, we got to our Final representation, but yeah, and, but since since you have this like transformer layer that's applied to the right after you get us out of the language model, you know, you could imagine using those residue embeddings, which gradients have flown through them, you know, relating to this structural signal, and so actually you have you do have access to like this like enhanced s- sequence level embedding of structure, mm. also, but so. We didn't really investigate that, but you could. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in figuring out, I mean, this we're we're the very early stages as a you know, as a research uh, community. We're at the early stages of investigating um, this engineering science of what are the best ways to visualize and to understand neural networks. Um, the I recently came across the circuits um, visualization on Distill and seems like that kind of investigation of circuits within here with visualizations would be uh, would be useful, especially given that you can get the sequence and the structure information into, into one embedding. Um, to build on that, um, based on what you currently know and have seen in the current state of the arts, what are the ways that you would suggest moving forward with, with this if you um, wanted to bring it up to yeah, current current methods. Uh, sorry. So I mean, one thing that that we haven't seen that we you could use TMVEC for, for example, is protein design. So you could not only are you you know this is re- in, in principle it's an annotation and vector comparison tool, which is itself kind of a different field, really important, really useful. Um, you know, in terms of therapy and even useful in the context of like therapeutic discovery. Also on the other side of therapeutic discovery, you know, we want to develop molecules that are, you know, um, uh, like neutralize an antigen or whatever, cat- catalyze some kind of reaction. So you could imagine, you know, using TMVEC to guide the generation of, pro- of uh, protein sequences so that you could, you um, and since since it's it, it's like representation is sort of informed by structure, and structure confers the function, you can imagine using this structural signal to guide the generation. So that's that's one, that's one possibility. I mean, you know, basically, you know, control net like diffusion models. You can imagine you could imagine using a having a, a control net with a TMVEC type signal. You know? mm, so the oracle essentially is the TMVEC giving it a or the. TM score approximated by TMVEC, which then is feedback to the any any model that's moving through a space on right. a diffusion model. Yeah, I mean the the applications that we were just starting to work on um, that I'm still really excited about are, are metagenomic applications where you just have 
billions of un unannotated proteins and mm -hmm. um, you know learning about you know, new undiscovered proteins that could have therapeutic uses. Natural product discoveries just seems like a, um, a bit of a green, green field. Um, as one example, we um, as as part of the team, we uh, analyzed uh, this class of molecules called bacterial seeds, which are basically like the antibiotics or antipeptides of bacteria, um, and um, obviously, like you know, most uh, bacteria would have these because it's how else do you fight against invaders, fight against your brethren. Mm -hmm. uh, so that only a thousand have been classified, uh, even though there potentially are you know, billions, trillions out there. Um, so we just applied TMBEC and, and to you know, different classes of bacteria seeds to see if we could capture class and subclass information. And remarkably, we were able to distinguish between these different um, these different um, bacteria seeds and was that was that due to the fact that you had some whose structure was known who were the model was trained on? So they were annotated. I think that there were some structures, not that we trained on, but there were there are a handful of structures out of a thousand that are available. Um, okay, so, so some that are available, and then you can look and see which ones are near those ones. Like those are essentially your labeled. Yeah. So, so there were there are a thousand categorized. Bacteria seeds. Where they don't have the structures for all of them, but they do. They have categorized them through experiments or sequence similarity. Um, but I think one reason why they are so difficult to categorize it is, is that they do exhibit like extreme sequence and structure um, diversity. Mm -hmm. So they're hard to spot. That's you know, and, and they're hard to um, uh, annotate. That's you have hard, hard, hard spot, but you have some that are labeled, and so you can look yeah. in your structure space for nearby ones to the ones that are that are labeled. Exactly, and, and for that, we actually uh, just looked at that those you know those a thousand bacteria seeds embedded in all of them, and then you know looked at how they clustered, and it turned out that they clustered into their like, subclass groups and their class groups, and um, that kind of got us excited. Maybe we could point this towards bigger. Data sets of proteins and or genomes, um, and then try to find some of these some, some of these isolated gene clusters. Oh yeah, it would be really nice if this thing was up and running, and so in any kind of protein database, it could be like, oh, similar ones based on the TM space similarity. Um, that would be the kind of resource that, in an ideal world where the compute was available, that would that would be something that could um, guide researchers who don't have a computational background to find um, similar um, labeled things to new proteins are investigating. And that's a good point, because not even with TMBEC and a lot of the methods that we've been working on in our, um, in our PhDs, um, you know, we need GPUs to train these models, and not all the researchers have GPUs or know how to use them. And I think that bioinformatics and biology, it's only in the last couple of years that GPUs really became so relevant. And important to yeah. uh, you know, use any of these tools. So that's definitely a hurdle that we have. And, and you know, there are tools like you know, using Google Colab, like you mentioned, people were actually integrating their methods into Google Colab. So like Colab Fold, Fold Seek, um, different tools that are. Yeah. I mean, also, yeah. And the only thing I'd add is like, you also have this development in, you know, quantization. So maybe at some point, you know, we'll be able to, you know, distill models and fit them onto our phones. And you could, or, mm -hmm. you know, in, in an ideal world, right? Like a, uh, an app where you scan a, a protein in your lab and you, and you get back up. I mean, they, they really should be one bit models for proteins. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's that new trend of one bit, like a bits and bytes kind of thing. There, there's a, there was a, a paper that just came out. It was like a one bit language model. <laughs> it was making the point that if you reduce the fidelity of yeah. your operations, you actually add noise, which you want to do, and which you're currently using really high fidelity, like floats or something. Yeah, and then you're adding noise, and they're like, wait, you could do both by simply have less fidelity yeah. on your on your. Uh, representation of numbers that you're doing that on.
Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, also in you know, B float sixteen, you know, we only yeah. need sixteen bits in order to in, in, in yeah. encode these. So, yeah, I'm. I feel bullish on the idea of eventually we'll solve like the com compute problem, uh, but that's you know ways away. I need to finish my PhD, yeah. so I need. Yeah, I, yeah. Need, <laughs> I need. I need to <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think it's more of an access and dialogue issue between the computational world and the experimentalist world to there are, are tools that get rubber stamped and then that is like the resource that you go to and you do blast and you look at um, your alignment in a in the same web UI yeah. but like getting things to go into that rubber stamp world um, is not easy and takes a lot of acceptance before it goes in and even once it's in there then it's like a one organization that's maintaining that one tool. Um, the trickiness is simply it's, you know, you're not going to get everyone who, all the, the usage of ChatGPT has been enabled by the fact that the GPUs are all in, let's say in this case, OpenAI's data center and they're being accessed via, via a well-built um, web UI that, yeah. that people know to go back to. Um, so some, yeah, I'm kind of just thinking of ways that this could become more accessible because the faster acceleration of new computational tools is um, in the usage of a web UI that has access to something like this. For, for example, we see using LangChain, you can give agents access to Bing Search or Google Drive or things like that. So you can potentially imagine like a biology assistant GPT tool that can go and run these queries for them in the background. Yeah, I think I think those types of uh, projects are definitely emerging, like in in industry also. So they're definitely I, that's definitely possible. I mean, you know, AlphaFold collaborating with the EBI as well is also kind of an example of this, where now we have millions of computationally generated structures. Just like some of them are not high quality, but at least we took a stab at it. And so, um, uh, you know, yeah, that's also just also really nice that we just have these, you know, people are pre-computing them, depositing them on, in these databases. Mm -hmm. Now they're freely accessible to researchers and practitioners. Um, so yeah, so that's great. Yeah. Um, let's discuss, um, uh what you're currently doing in, in AI and on what you're currently excited about is, is your next, is your next step? Uh, yeah. So, um, I'm working on a, a research project. I mean, also related to like uh, protein language modeling and, uh, in particular, I mean, I'm interested in protein design. So it's kind of a molecular generation project. Uh, before that I was, I, 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 I did some work on like, a uh, something, uh, a model that is sort of competitive with diffusion models, but it's a slightly sim like simpler kind of paradigm based on uh, this uh, work called neural empirical base. And so broadly, you know, what I'm working on right now, sort of like protein design uh, methodology using um, language models or other similar, uh, you know, powerful architectures. Yeah, I, I uh... I finished my PhD last summer and then um, uh, started working on a uh, digital health startup uh, where we're using language models uh, for a different multi-label, multi-class classification problem of um, medical coding. So uh, the inputs there aren't protein sequences, but instead you know, pages of medical jargon. And then the outputs aren't you know, functions or structures that are um, kind of one of 150,000 possible codes, but um, and many codes for a given uh, set of jargon. So it's uh, a fun problem space to be in. Definitely uh, a lot different than than uh, biology. Well, you mentioned that the most time consuming and time we spent the most thing spent the most time on was wrangling data to be able to get stuff from as far back as the 90s to be translatable into the right embedding space. That is, I mean, I think the day-to-day -day is almost identical <laughs> between the two uh, because yeah, data is always the hardest thing to, in, in, I mean, 
my experience, um, any machine learning workflow, that's what you spend most of your time on, getting the data set prepared, and um, in, in our case, you know, getting partner data from APIs and making sure that it's in a secure HIPAA environment and then cleaning it properly and then how do you deal with a hundred different node types and missing this and mm -hmm. um, what tokenizer do you use for you know medical jargon? How do you compare with other methods? And then you know benchmarking is a whole other can of worms because you're not gonna bend, you know there are like your classic benchmark data sets and yeah. medical research as well. Um, but those are you know all done on kind of tiny data sets that are a little bit contrived and you know, methods that do great there aren't necessarily going to translate to the real world too. Yeah. So, so it's an interesting problem and, and a lot of similarities and a little bit different because it's not biology or genomics. I, I have a question about that. Yeah. Do you find that, you know, communicating results is more or less difficult in this new environment? Like, you know, previously it's like, communicating your results to scientists. Now it's shareholders or what have you. So, you know, what, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think it's, you know, we've, uh, we've had a lot of debates about which metrics do you use and pick mm -hmm. you know, precision, recall, you know, at K metrics, uh, mm -hmm. accuracy, because a lot of these terms aren't, um, Aren't, you know, people aren't familiar with them. Um, generalists aren't familiar with them, but they want to know like that you're trending in the right direction. That's kind of on the shareholder, or investor, or, you know, team member side. And then partners obviously would be more familiar with the metrics that they care about. Um, so you know you have to kind of deliver deliver the you know, metrics that that they're asking for, and then they'll calculate it themselves too. Okay. But, um, okay, so your output is going to be this labels um, code. Um, is there any way to get like human feedback on that, and then have that be a way to tune your model further? Yeah, I mean that's a great that's a great uh, a great point and question. Uh, mm -hmm. It's definitely something that we are working on. Yeah, uh, I mean I feel like any any company <laughs> any company that's going model is uh, a spin wheel. And the spin wheel, as you get feedback, iterates the model, and then yeah. from there, um, you hope to keep spinning the thing at a higher velocity and a higher throughput to be able to uh, get the whole thing off the ground. I mean, so yeah, I mean, labels are just so magnificent. Having, uh, having clean labels or you know, adjusted labels or any sort of gold standard that you can trust is just so beneficial to <laughs> learning. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And otherwise, it's just you know hard to make sense of predicting new things. So if you, you know, think yeah. of like that classic machine learning data set, what if you make a prediction that isn't there? Are you right? Are they wrong? And in the case of medical, these medical data sets, there are a lot of mistakes. So mm. um, there's this data set that. that We've been using called Nimic, and um, you know, a, a company recently kind of audited the data set and found that you know, there were over, you know, I think the accuracy was fifty like, between fifty and sixty percent uh, of the ground truth labels. So, oh, so, so when you're dealing with with that sort of problem, you, you really have to um, yeah, yeah have, that's, have other humans. So like that, this industry has high signal to noise ratio or low yeah. signal to noise ratio yeah. in general or lowish. I think that's just this research data set that everyone uses, and oh. there's. I, I I think that part of the issue with that particular data set is that they leave certain note types out. So you can imagine they only include discharge summaries where there might be you know, many other note types, and you know, going from that text to a label space, maybe there is an evidence for some of those labels in that text space. So totally. that's the part of the accuracy issue. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of the accuracy issue is, is the high signal to noise ratio that you have humans, you know, who are um, gonna have different styles and different techniques for coding, mm -hmm. uh, applying rules. 
You know what? That, that reminds me of uh, recently I was watching a podcast interview with Dennis Osavis where he was talking about whether or not you're building an entire agent creature, sort of a thing that's acting on its own or building a tool. And it seems like when you're stuck in a world where your accuracy, you have a very high noise to signal ratio, the best you can build is a tool that can allow someone to at least peer through a bit more of the murkiness than they could otherwise. Um, is that sort of your way of thinking about it? Yeah, I, I, I totally, um, I totally agree with that. Um, we're trying to build co-pilots that, you know, can guide coders and administrators through all the medical jargon and, and, and make it a, an easier, uh, easier process. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out how the person is going to interface with this thing becomes, make, makes interface design a really important yeah. project too. It, it, you, you can see how, you know, with the start of many, many things <laughs> come out. <laughs> Everything's on fire. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to have you back on as, uh, as the startup progresses, uh, hear about the story. Uh, as a closing question, um, we'd like to get your feedback on whether or not the large language models that now are ubiquitously available, um, whether you think that's actually helping or hurting um, the speed of the field um, of, let's say, um, breakthroughs in machine learning. So, for example, if we look at some of the big um, things on the timeline, like AlexNet and then the Transformer, neither one of those has any coefficient of being accelerated by any breakthroughs in the field. It's not like someone was using a neural net um, to help them generate code when they were working on the Transformer. Do you think that they're, when we get to the next unexpectedly large transformative um, breakthrough, um, that they will be probably have used Copilot to generate some of the code and the scripting along the way. In the last year, let's say over 2023, what coefficients would you say um, AI capabilities research has actually contributed to speed in the field? Yeah, uh, well, I can go first. Um, I mean, from my perspective, I don't, I've never really used Copilot. Um, because I find that I, I mean, I just have a reluctance to install it. I imagine, <laughs> I imagine that for people that um, are coming from, for example, a, a more biological background, they are not so familiar with coding, and so now you now you are you know endowed with this capability of like generating quality code, even tests. I saw I saw uh, you know Facebook has or Meta is you know improving their test suite using language models. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you could actually generate a pretty quality code base um, using Copilot that has your method inside of it or is, is you know, write it, is implementing your method. So there I can, I can see it in the future. Well, that's, that's the sort of like sunny view of it. You know, it could, it could improve um, research. It can improve usability, you know, 90% of bioinformatics tools are broken. So you know, um, <laughs> it, it's like, you know, maybe it'll make the things more usable. Um, the, I guess on the other side of it, the, the, the worrisome piece is, the, is just the, you know, will this um, lower the signal to noise ratio in the field? Like, um, you, you know, in the worst case, you have papers that are written by ChatGPT and then reviewed by ChatGPT and then, uh, summarized by ChatGPT because no one even feels like reading past the abstract, and um, you know I, do, yeah. I don't want to see a field like that. And in so, the worst case, it's an excuse to be lazy, and then human productivity drops because of yeah general malaise about LLMs taking over. Yeah, <laughs> and also maybe redundant. There's higher redundancy yeah. because people just are, are aren't so you know abreast to the field. Uh, yeah, so I guess. Um, in general, I, I, I feel like the, fir the first part is going to it's, it's like it, it's going to help because what we need in in AI bio biology AI is more biologists, not mm -hmm. more AI people. <laughs> I mean, ideally, because you know they yeah. actually know the 
the field. Um, they don't want, they're not trying to solve everybody's problem. They just, they have a problem that they want to now use these methods with. And so that I, I so I, I feel like that it could open it up itself up for that. That was a fun answer. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll first start with um, the meta question of um, maybe is the scale, is scale getting to us, you know, and I think that your research has shown that as a society, research society, um, hmm. scientific society, we are becoming less disruptive with our research. Uh, they measure this in different ways. Um, and life sciences is, is actually the only, um, I think, the only major discipline where we're, we're increasing in terms of the number of disruptive papers mm -hmm. every year over year. So I think that the bio AI space will be a standout space um, compared to other fields. Um, the whole reason behind kind of the lack of disruption is like systemic issues around our funding landscape and how incentives. you have incentives mm -hmm. and you basically like apply for a grant after you've done the research or answered the question and then we just have like a confirmation, mm -hmm. um, a system of confirmation. Um, and I think that that, um, that's a whole other issue. But I think you know, AI specifically didn't have that many researchers in it 20 years ago. Now, even 10 years ago, there weren't that many researchers. Whereas now, you know, you go to Thanksgiving and everyone's using ChatGPT <laughs> and everyone knows what a language model is. And you have every company like developing their language modeling team or their like AI strategy. And I think we're going to definitely waste a lot more electricity and GPUs on the problem. Probably too many people are going to focus on scale as king, but mm -hmm. having that many more eyeballs and that much more effort, like focused on AI, will has to lead to breakthroughs. So I think you know having you know, half yeah. the world focusing on AI will will lead to some. I think the stakes are going to be huge. It will generate more heat than light, but it'll still nonetheless generate more light. Is the is the thought process? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially given yeah, historical trends, yeah, I, I think that AI will have, you know, perhaps uh, some boom years. And if if scale doesn't solve all issues, there could there could be like a another uh, valley of death for AI. Maybe yeah. due to uh, yeah the, the challenge of missed expectations. It doesn't necessarily mean even if expectations. Yeah. Are like, yeah, even if growth and acceleration continues, but the expectations are missed, yeah. you're going to see loud redu reduction in funding, which um, yeah. which will correspond to like a moving out of the hype years into what they call the AI winter was what yeah. the fun the previous one of these looked like from what the 1960s to the 2000 2010. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, until until Alice met. Um, so. I, Think that, that extrapolation makes sense. What I'm understanding from that answer is that the coefficient to which the successes of AI has accelerated AI itself is still near zero. If it weren't for the fact that it has a side effect of getting people excited about it, and the, the number of people joining the field is the main driver behind it. I think, however, you start seeing GPUs hit the market that used uh, generative models to do the actual. Um, Lithography, which is yeah. also one thing that the CEO of NVIDIA recently talked about when they announced their latest uh, GPU um, at the GTC keynotes, um, that already is some non-zero coefficient of generative models yeah. aiding the development of generative models. And I think we'll probably start to see those starting to hit at every level of the um, essentially expanding research pipeline. Um, whether it's in GPUs or whether it's in students being more productive. Um, unfortunately, we've yet to see much ways that LLMs can be used in, I would say, coherent tutoring and teaching, but there's also a big opportunity there is a way to sort of assess what someone's knowledge base and how it mismatches what they need to know out of the course and then doing targeted one-on-one -on -one tutoring. One-on-one -on -one tutoring has been shown to be like two standard deviations uh, better than general 
purpose, like sitting in class, like you give a student a one-on-one -on -one tutor and they start improving dramatically. So if we can find a way to make that happen and then have students leaving school, leaving all levels of schooling with one-on-one -on -one tutors that this enables, I think mean, that will be one of the biggest blockers that then is knocked down for getting researchers to have higher levels of education and accelerate their learning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, We'll, we'll call it a wrap there. Thank you, Nick. Nice. Nice yeah, thanks. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's fun.